Today's panel for next is an opportunity culture for um, teachers and students, and of course we've been talking about that, and our next panel is supporting uh, teacher leaders at the school and district level, so I want to introduce to you our panelists today. Uh, we have Elizabeth Cole. Elizabeth is a 1995 graduate from the College of Education at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and after teaching for 16 years at the elementary level in Iredell and Bladen counties, she decided to pursue her goal of school leadership and was accepted into the Sand Hills Leadership Academy, Cohort 2. And after receiving her principal license, she has served as an assistant principal at Elizabethtown Middle School for one year before becoming the principal there. So it's good to have you with us. James Ford uh, is at Garinger High School, and he is the 2014 Burroughs Welcome Fund North Carolina Teacher of the Year. Congratulations, Mr. Ford. Uh, Mr. Ford teaches ninth grade world history, and he began his, his career in Rockford Public Schools in Rockford, Illinois. We're glad you're here in North Carolina. He graduated from Illinois State University in 2003 with a bachelor's degree in mass communication. In 2009, he received a master's of arts in teaching from Rockford College in Illinois. He is currently working towards uh, earning a doctoral degree in educational leadership from Wingate University. Larry Hodgins is the assistant principal at South Creek Middle School in Martin County. Mr. Hodgins is a national board certified middle grades math teacher and he also holds teaching certificates in science and social studies. He holds a BA in physics from Bowdoin College, a BS in chemical engineering from Columbia University, and an MS in environmental engineering from the University of Massachusetts. Amherst and earned his teaching credentials through the Alternative Licensure Program at East Carolina University. Currently, he is pursuing a Master's in School Administration from North Carolina State through the Northeast Leadership Academy. Juice Marmanis, she has 14 years of experience in education in diverse settings. Originally from Venezuela, she is a graduate of the Piedmont Triad Leadership Academy, Cohort 1. Manus was an assistant principal at Southern Guilford Middle School and Jones Elementary with Guilford County Schools, and she is currently the principal at Balfour Elementary in Asheboro City Schools. Eddie Price has been an educator for 23 years, serving as a teacher, a coach, an assistant principal, and presently as the, pre as the principal of South Johnson High School. He completed his undergraduate studies from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington and he earned both his MSA and doctorate at the University of North Carolina State. He is married to an educator, Kathy, and has three children, Eli, Bailey, and Charlie. And then Erin Swanson. She's the principal of Martin Millennium Academy in Edgecombe County, North Carolina. She received a Master's of School Administration degree as part of the first cohort of North Carolina State University's Northeast Leadership Academy. Prior to her participation in NELA, Swanson was a member of the Teach for America Eastern North Carolina staff for six years. So will you please help me welcome our panelists today. <laughs> We're going to begin with this panelist with uh, two of our educators and uh, they're going to do a presentation. So we'll first hear from Larry Hodgins followed by um, Eddie Price and then we're going to open it up for panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge Eric, Rick, and Brian for their remarks this morning. I really enjoyed listening to them. Uh, you guys had some great ideas on, on how we try to figure out reimagining and moving education um, forward. And just in response to, in my opinion, there is no magic uh, in any of this. It, it honestly is, is literally rolling up your sleeves and, and doing the work. And honestly, the Northeast Leadership Academy here under Dr. Fuzzarelli's leadership and, and so many other people here have, has really empowered me to do that work. Um, and honestly, before I go any further, anyone else who's a graduate of or a current student at one of the three leadership academies, could you just stand, please? And I, po I, po I point that out because Doing this myself, yes, that is a path to burnout, but seeing everybody out here together and knowing that I have a, a group of, of colleagues who are all in this together, to me, that is sustainable, and, and that's what the leadership academies are building here, and, and these leadership academies are thanks to your taxpayer dollars. I just want to take just a couple minutes here at the beginning 
to just give you a little bit of glimpse as to what that means, uh, what my interpretation of that is, um, and, and how we've done that. And before I get too much farther, I, just, I do want to acknowledge Misty Rushing, who did her administrative internship at my school last year, and is, it was really a big part of all this as well. My, and my principal, who couldn't be here today, because I, I really, every time I walk in my building, I think I work for my teachers. I, I'm trying to do whatever I can so that they can get their job done. And my principal felt as though she needed to stay back as we really worked together as a team. So Jan Wagner, principal of South Creek Middle School, really deserves a lot of credit for this as well. Um, so in general, I really don't like PowerPoints, but it was just the easiest way to, to frame this. Uh, and, and for me, at, at our school, uh, PRIDE, the acronym PRIDE, is what we use for our PBIS. So I just kind of fit it into this framework here as to what, um, how I'm going to do this. Um, before I start real quick, actually, the, the EVOS data, these first two slides are our schools all the way on the left there. That's our composite growth scores for the last two years compared with the other schools in our district. So you can go to the next one, Laura. And, and we've actually been above six and a half each of those last two years. Uh, Bonnie and I were talking to a couple people this earlier, first thing this morning. That put us in the top 5% in the state. And there's a lot of discussion now about how to use growth scores in terms of ranking and, and grading schools. So I just want to just give you a real quick visual as to what the top 5% in the state really looks like. So Billy, if you could help me unroll this here. This is the ranking of all the schools in the state put in order. He's got the lowest ones on his end right there. Thank you. And so these, these are all the schools in which students take EOGs in North Carolina in order in terms of their EVOS scores. And I'm going to show you where our school, that, that's good right there. Um, we're right here. <laughs> so that's, that's what the top 5% looks like. We've done that two years in a row now and, and look forward to, to moving up the list a little bit higher even this, this coming year. All right, so the first P is procedures. And, and Harry Wong's done a lot of work on this, so we, we didn't um, invent this ourselves. But... You know, students need to know and teachers exactly what to do in, in all types of situations. And this really for us is just part of expectations. What do we want everyone to do? Then procedures, how are we going to do it? And then consequences are the next step. Okay, if you don't follow the procedures, this is what's going to happen. Uh, then the next one is, re is relationships. I'm going to go through these sort of quickly, just because I know we're running behind and I've got a lot of great panel members behind me that have some good things to say. Uh, the next thing is just relationships. And uh, you know, you need to have that with your community members, your, your faculty, and your staff. And I've just got a really quick uh, video here of an, of an interview. Well, most of all, Mr. Hodgkins, I see you. I see your heart. With, with your, partic your participant, and your concern, and even when you stepped into our church, when you, in, when, when you answered the, the invitation, that showed a lot about the heart. Because a child invites you to come to their church, and you show up, you don't have an excuse, that means a lot. It did, a, it did something awesome in the heart of that child. My principal, my assistant principal came to church. That's, that's building them up. You'd be surprised at what your actions by itself does. I see a school which I have not seen since I've been in school. To see that, you know, the spirit of that is still alive. Somebody, somebody cares. You know what I'm it's, not, it's not dormant. It has not completely died. That is still alive. And I took away that, you know, I see that the school it wants to change, uh, uh, should I say, wants to do more than just teach. So it's really, it's, it's, just, it's just doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not even uh, rocket science necessarily and, and building those relationships with, with key people in the communities and, and building trust with, with our schools, uh, one, one community leader, one student, one parent, one family at a time. Um, and, and so the next one for the I, which is right in the middle of the word pride and has to be the center of any successful school, is, is instructional focus. Uh, one of the key things that we've done is, is we've taken some of our best teachers, actually, and we have busted them out of their classrooms. 
uh, and we've really identified this with the use of our EVOS data. We really use that not as much to evaluate teachers, that's certainly a component of it, but to actually look at individual students and their probabilities of success. So we've identified students with low probabilities yet who are working hard in the classroom and we actually give them extra time with our very best teachers because not every student can learn at the same rate. So today going on in my middle school actually everybody gets at least 70 minutes of, of reading and math and I agree that those may not necessarily be the best indicators but that's the game that we're playing right now at least. Some students have 70 minutes a day, others have 145. Uh, those, that extra time is with our very best teachers and, and that definitely benefits our, our students a lot. Again, because some, some students can pick things up quicker, others not as much. You can just skip that one actually. All right, so the next one is discipline. Uh, that's the last four years sequentially of our cumulative write-ups at our school. And what that really has allowed us to do is free up that time. Um, I probably spend, honestly, about uh, 30 minutes a week, typically, dealing with, with discipline issues right now. And, and that really, to me, lies at the intersection of the procedures and the, and the relationship piece, honestly. If you can get those two taken care of, uh, the discipline is going to follow. And, and the last one there actually is for everyone, get everyone on, on board. Uh, that, that photo right there is of a couple of our cafeteria workers wearing the shirts that are part of our college, uh, college going mindset is what we're trying to bring down to our middle school students. Um, so even, even our cafeteria workers, everybody in the building, we all have the same mindset, the same goal, and the, and the same focus. So um, just in a little nutshell there, that's really what I got out of Nilo and what it looks like in practice to me. And I know you're going to hear some great things from uh, some other people here. So I really appreciate your attention. Thank you. I guess we, um, I, I thought it was actually a pot of coffee or the two energy drinks uh, that I had this morning, but it's just, uh, I, I think it's not. It's the inspiration. It's a great day to be an educator. Glad to be here. Um, Dana Jernigan, Bennett Jones, if you raise your hand, they're, they're the better part of anything that we do at South Johnson, the assistant principals. Um, you know, uh, I think when I arrived, we said, you have about eight minutes, so I'm going to have to talk like Jimmy John's commercial, so <laughs> just stop me. Some of this I'm going to have to skip simply because of time, but I want you to understand that uh, as uh, you can process this, the first question we get about our schedule is that it may not work at our school, and it can work. Everything can work. It depends on the consensus building, uh, the creation of teamwork, and I would talk about each of these, but it's uh, suffice to say that five years ago when I inherited this school, um, which has become the highlight of my career, it was a very difficult setting and one in which you would not consider to do anything innovative. You found yourself uh, kind of inundated and overwhelmed with discipline, uh, uh, personnel, uh, the, the issues that we typically have in schools that are not working. Uh, we use a lot of data and I'm going to uh, you know, move through this quickly to show you that there in five years has been quite a change and then tell you why that has happened. Um, we broke our uh, teacher working condition survey data into five pieces and we compared it to ourselves in that uh, uh, period and also to other schools uh, who had the perception of being uh, high flying schools. And if you can take a look at that, you'll see our participation rate and then the um, the improvement that we've made and then in comparison to them uh, where we stand. And this was the uh, overarching climate, time, you know, giving back time. We've heard that uh, in two of the, the speakers today. Uh, and that's what we're going to focus on, talking about a schedule that gave the teachers back the time so that they could be professional. Student conduct, uh, you know, piggybacking on what was just said by Larry, you know, we have a visual as well that talks about our uh, discipline and how creating a uh, pyramid that for behavior and um, using our resources creatively, we created or um, organized a, a, a behavioral specialist, an interventionist for each block so that the people who should be and can be uh, by relationship could be uh, 
taking care of this issue would free us up to be in the uh, classroom to work on instruction. Teacher leadership, you know, empowering teachers, the cage, uh, this says it all for us as far as what uh, our folks, how they feel about teacher leadership. And then instructional support, we'll skip over a little bit of that. It talks about um, the state and district level, so I'll, I'll skip that. For, that's for another conversation. Um, <laughs> this is the four-year graduation rate, and, and as Mr. Jones uh, often says, people say they, they look at 2013 or 14 and say, what happened? you know, between 2013 and 14. It didn't happen then, it happened uh, in the five previous years. Um, that was the first group in 2014 we had for all four years who we have developed relationships with who could experience our intervention schedule um, and could see the change in the culture and climate at our school. We're projected somewhere right now if we stop today, which is fine with me, if we stop today, 95.7% graduation rate for your uh, cohort. Um, dropout rate over the last five years um, from 81 to 20, and if, as we said, we stopped today, it would be uh, 13 dropouts as of right now. So if we're keeping them, save the applause, I don't have time because we're on a budget evidently. So um, the, uh, if you take a look at the, uh, you would imagine keeping kids in school, then your, um, your scores would drop, and that's not the case, or your behavior would go up. Both not the case. Our cohort is steadily climbing. Uh, we hope to see or expect to see this year uh, great strides in academics, and then if you take a look, office referrals have dropped. They did a much better job with the visual so that you could imagine and the visual here, but I think that uh, just looking at those numbers, you know that we're freed up. I'm not sure how many minutes per week we deal with discipline, but it is far less than we did five years ago. And you know, you, you say, well, what happened? Five years ago, I walked in and, and uh, looking at a, a group who had, um, I had asked over the summer to make some comments about things that they wanted to change, and they wanted time, more time to be professionals, to be better uh, instructors, and um, then they wanted a way to reach the kids because in our population, the before and after school or the extended block wasn't working as an intervention, but they wanted to work with kids, so they wanted more time to work with kids. So the first question was, how's it working for you? Just borrowed it from Dr. Phil, and um, I didn't walk in and do the little thing that he does toward his wife, but um, I will say that it wasn't working and they were ready for a change. We took a box of everything that had happened before the comments they had made, and we put them in um, a sealed box, and I had the administrators go out and bury that out front. Uh, we don't talk about this from this point forward. We all have identified problems, now let's problem solve. I'm gonna give you the time, we're gonna solve the problems. And uh, most importantly, the teachers own the school now. Teachers and students own South Johnston High School. I'm just, unfortunately, they can't be here to speak, so I was selected to come in and talk. Um, I'm probably the last one sh who should be talking. Those two should be speaking, then the students and the teachers because they own the school. Uh, we took seven months, um, a process, we visited. There were uh, all stakeholders, community, parents, students, and we uh, visited schools for seven months and brought back each time and presented out to the faculty and staff, uh, different schedules, uh, ways to intervene with students, and said basically, you make it what you need it to be. How does it fit for South Johnston High School? It took seven months for us to research to plan and begin implementation. Um, the subcommittees were joined or formed and nearly everyone in the school wanted to have a voice and to be on a committee so that they could create this, uh, this new schedule. They had objectives, they took care of it, and then there's accountability. I wanna uh, move to, to show you what Power Block is. Uh, just in wording, uh, plan, organize, work, eat, relax, and once again, I have no creativity whatsoever students and teachers came up with everything that you're about to see. Uh, the daily bell schedule, in a nutshell, five blocks of 82 minutes. One of those blocks being focused around lunch. You hear it called smart lunch, you hear it power block, um, a lot of different names, but I think every one of them has to be different in order to fit the uh, clientele uh, and the personnel of your school. And so ours is called power block and this is what it looks like as far as the daily schedule. Weekly teacher schedule, 
um, every department, and, and I'm starting to feel pretty bad about myself because one, I don't have any creativity, and two, uh, I guess I couldn't create the logistics of this because someone else created this as well. Um, <laughs> each department has the five days, of course, and they have two days that they are open to tutorials. Um, one day, which is a supervision, one day is department PLC, it rotates, and then one day is a completely free day for additional planning. So if, if you're not from a high school, when you talk to elementary and middle school folks, they go crazy over this uh, because you say you, you have a planning first, that's great, and it's 82 minutes, but then one day a week you have a second planning of 82 minutes. But now this stuff is structured so that we are everything has an agenda. Every day has an agenda for what you're doing with that time. Um, the interesting thing about this is your duties are broken down and I didn't create that either. Um, <laughs> but the subcommittee, uh, they stood in every area in our building. They moved around during the instructional day and looked at places where we would need people and they created these spots and we assigned rotations for everyone. I'm in the cafeteria every day, every day other than Monday and I have um, English PLC. I, I'm uh, a part of that on Mondays. Each admin is scheduled uh, with a different PLC. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I am uh, in the cafeteria and it's a great way to develop relationships with people, with kids to find out what's going on and um, it's probably the most exciting part of my day. Um, if I couldn't do that, I probably wouldn't want to be in education. Um, the attendance, the accountability for students, let me, let me back up for just a moment. For teachers, they have one supervision. They created this uh, system where, um, in this next slide you'll see, we take, uh, Mr. Jones after three weeks takes, totals the numbers of students that each teacher has served. And then we, by department, decide on if you're not serving kids, we're going to help you serve kids. So instead of having uh, two tutorials, if you're not using those, you may need a second supervision and one tutorial. The teachers came up with that. We could not have done that. The, the, the admin team could not have uh, sold that. They came up with that, and so they believe in it. And uh, the way they see it is if you're not going to use tutorials and we have uh, someone on, in the ag hallway who says, I do most of my stuff after school anyway, so I'll be glad to take a second supervision so that another teacher who's serving kids in a remediation, reteaching uh, capacity can have, I can cover their duties so they can uh, uh, be with kids uh, teaching. This is how the student accountability, teacher accountability, uh, Mr. Jones is a wizard when it comes to technology, so he has something that compiles all of the attendance. This is a great uh, spreadsheet to have when you're talking to a parent. My student needs extra credit about this time. Do you offer extra credit? How can you help me with attendance? Because my student is going to power. And so I pull this up and say, we have an issue because your student's not going to power to make up attendance or to recover grades. And we have a policy everyone can retake, but they have to first go to remediation. You cannot retake anything without remediating. This isn't a lottery. There's some reteaching going on. So here, the attendance accountability piece is huge for the student and for the teacher. All right, I think I did that in eight minutes. Okay, so um, any questions? I, I don't know what the format is at this point. Do I hide, sit down? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I did want to point out one thing on Eddie's schedule um, or the team's schedule that they had. That I was sitting and talking to a team a couple, last week or two weeks ago uh, out at South Johnston, and um, we did some math. And I said, do you realize that you guys have gotten back 36, was it? 36 full days of instruction by creating this schedule. 36 full days of instruction by just shifting the, the schedule. And so they're doing some pretty impressive stuff. And this is all working around um, what, what Brian and Rick both were saying about how do you have teachers empowered to do things to change the, the way. So let me let you guys uh, take over the conversation. Maybe Aaron or somebody else can. Sure. 
Hi, everybody. <laughs> so I, I just listening to these two presentations, um, you know, I, I know one of the topics that we're supposed to be speaking on is, are some of the barriers um, to doing this type of work in our schools. And um, you know, listening to Larry and Eddie uh, reminds me that um, they have really stepped out of the way of their teachers and their staffs and really let them lead. And I think that. Um, you know, we can be the barriers. I think sometimes administrators are the barriers in, in making this type of change. Uh, you know, I, I think sometimes we make assumptions. You know, we come into schools, and, and I had the opportunity this year to open a brand new school in Edgecombe County, a, um, a K through eight global school, which is um, a phenomenal experience, phenomenal opportunity. And, um, and I said coming in, you know, I really want this to be a culture where, you know, all of our staff uh, are leaders. You know, we all have these opportunities to, um, to make whatever we want happen, happen. Um, and I said that, uh, uh, and so I thought, you know, okay, so everybody's buying into that. Um, and then we, we brought in a, a consultant a couple weeks ago to do some work with restorative justice, restorative practices in our school. It was an amazing session. Um, we asked for some feedback afterwards. And, um, and I had one teacher who responded, can we really do this in our school? And another one said, is the district gonna let this happen? And so, you know, you realize, like, you say these things, um, but unless you really create that culture where people feel like they can be leaders, where they, are, they really feel empowered, um, it, it, it doesn't happen. People don't feel like they, um, that they can do those, um, those type, or this type of work, you know, that's being described here. So, you know, I really applaud Eddie and Larry for, um, for that. I think, uh, you know, all of us, those practicing principals, those of us who are um, soon to be principals have a lot to learn learn um, from what Eddie and Larry are doing in their schools. Got my own. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for what you're doing. And I want to give you some praise and some, some credit because you guys seem to be doing some transformative work there. And it really like put a smile on my face just to see it because that is truly what it's about. It's about making tangible gains uh, in the lives. And it's really engineering. I'm sitting here looking at it. I'm like, this is what you call real problem solving. you know. Um, and as it pertains to teacher leadership, I come with a different perspective. And uh, the way I've heard it best expressed is that uh, teacher leadership is, is an attitude. It's not an appointment. Uh, teachers tend to take leadership in areas that they're most passionate about. Um, and they're self-starters, right? And I'm sure you know in your schools that the teachers that are leaders, you know who they are. And most of the times, it expresses itself in uh, usually informal titles, uh, informal uh, aspects that aren't, that don't hold titles. People who just have an area of expertise or who have a passion about a certain thing and they kind of get up and go. And the environments that have been best for myself and the environments that I've seen thrive the most is where there's a distributive leadership environment where the leaders come through knowing that uh, none of us is as smart as all of us. And I've heard you continue to give accolades to everybody that you work with and I'm thinking to myself like, I could work for this guy, you know what I mean? Like. Um, <laughs> That's what it takes because you have, uh, there's a recognition that teachers aren't just teachers, right? That they come in with a wealth of experience, a wealth of skill sets, and a richness of different abilities that need to be tapped into outside of just the basic pedagogy. There are those who may, uh, they're published authors, those who may be able to lead staff development, those who could do scheduling, who are well-versed in things of that nature, and, and data analysis, and uh, even those who uh, you know, are, are, are you know, advocates, those who know how to coalesce different members of the teaching community. Uh, I, I think it's the truest description of, of what I consider myself as a teacher leader, one who possesses or embodies other skill sets outside of just the classroom, but is also uh, adept in that, in that vein as well. Getting everybody on board around a singular vision and then opening up the ears, opening up the hearts, and then uh, corralling everybody around a central goal, I think that's what allows uh, for true teacher leadership and, and school-wide prosperity to really take off. But you're right, there is this perception, this imaginary cage that, you know, should we be doing this? Isn't there a law? Aren't we breaking the law by doing this? But it's opening it up and making their environment, environment safe for risk-taking and safe for new and fresh ideas. So I applaud you. I'm sorry. I need to borrow yours. And if you see me shifting, it's because principals are not used to sitting down this long. So. Um, I think one of the things, if we're talking about the leadership academies and talking about this teacher empowerment, is that model that we're carrying to our practice because our teacher, our leadership academies empower us. Um, in my case, for PTLA, they empowered me to take that leadership role into a school. Um, the model that they presented with us with coaching, because it wasn't a general coaching, it was an individualized coaching, it was that support for each one of us, is the model that I've, that I've carried out into my school. And when we think a lot of times of teacher empowerment, we think about committees. Oh, how many teachers do I have in a committee? Or how many committees am I creating in my school to make sure everybody has something to do? 
And teacher empowerment is much more than that. In my school, I have 19 beginning teachers, 19. How many of them are really going to step up and say, I'm going to be chair of a committee? I'm going to lead this. I think in that case, we have to think about empowering teachers where we as, teach, as the leadership are coaches, where we have an open door where they feel comfortable to come to us and say, okay, I have a problem. Or, okay, I need help with this, what do I do? It's so, those simple steps that we do that then builds that rest of the empowerment for them to take lead, for them to want to build that school and the initiatives and the culture, and it's part of building that culture that is what help us keep on moving on. Um, simple things, a lot of the times as leaders, we think of professional development and we bring, how many people bring people from outside? I wanna bring so-and-so for them to lead this PD. And our teachers are sitting there just looking. Having, tapping on those resources that we have in-house because that's gonna get more buy-in. If they're seeing somebody that they know, they're seeing is effective, they can trust, then they're going to get more buy-in and they're going to want to be willing to step up and lead another one who says they cannot lead in another school, a PD in another school. So I think those little pieces of, of building that teacher capacity in our schools is what ends up making the difference that we're seeing in these schools because that's what we need more than just simple committees. Um, one simple case, um, and I'll give an example of at the school I'm at, First year in the school, 19 beginning teachers, low performing, teachers have not received any feedback. They thought that it was three observations and that's it. Building the capacity of having a peer come into your classroom and giving you feedback. And let's talk about what can we do together to make it better. Those are the things that we need to build much more if we wanna empower teachers in our schools. That will lead to the whole advertisement. We were talking about um, the three of us were actually talking about, I think only 27% of people are enrolling right now in education programs because our teachers are not doing the advertisement because we're not building that capacity in our schools for them to do the advertisement, to go out there and say, yeah, this is a viable profession. That's what Rick said. It is a viable profession, but the teachers have to do that advertisement if we wanna make that difference in our schools. So it's building that teacher empowerment in that way than just committees. I think when I sit in the room, I see administrators and I see um, many teacher leaders. I'm here because of being a teacher leader. I was the cage buster. I was ready to bust out of the cage um, to make a difference for others um, because my, I was under administration where we were not empowered and I wanted to be a leader of teachers where I could empower others and lead others to be that cage buster as well. Um, sitting here, I, I think about, for me, a challenge and possibly a barrier where I am. I'm in southeastern North Carolina in Bladen County, and if you know where Bladen County is, you know anything about Elizabethtown, North Carolina, we do not have a lot to attract teachers. When I hear only 27% of the people are going into education, well, what do we have in Bladen County to offer these educators to come back to us to put teacher leaders in our schools? Um, that's, that's a barrier that I'm up against. I feel like so recruiting, retaining uh, good, high-quality teachers in Bladen County is truly a challenge. So what can we do to sell Bladen County? What are we doing to sell education for people to come back? Um, I think for me personally, one of the things going into a school as a first-year principal is building that culture. And SLA graduates will tell you we said it's all about relationships, relationships, relationships. And I think trying to educate our teachers within our building of the children of whom we serve. You know, you hear them say, we got this, we know our kids, but I, I'm in a school that's probably about 78% African American, and I will tell you that we have maybe two African-American teachers on staff. And to hear the teachers in high poverty, we're 85% free and reduced lunch. So when you hear the teachers you know, trying to say that they're building that relationship and they understand, for me, it's about educating the teachers too of whom we're serving so that we can build those relationships and, and be a transformative school in that sense. Thank you. I guess just two quick points I'd like to add. Um, one is, is to use your data. Uh, the EVAS by SAS, honestly, I make the analogy um, that that's like money ball for schools. So anyone who's a baseball fan or, or Brad Pitt fan, because he, he was in the movie, 
Um, it, you can use that information on a student level to help drive instruction and identify which students need it the most. It, it, it does give you an advantage. And the difference between schools and baseball actually is this is not a zero-sum game. Um, so we can, all, we can all win by that. And, and if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to talk with you at greater length afterwards um, about that. Uh, and the other thing, too, is if, if you're in the legislature or have some connection to that, um, that role there that I pulled out, uh, our school that year, uh, we earned about 50, I think we were 58 points on the scale from which the report card was generated, which on the 15-point scale gave us, we were barely a C. Uh, but if the, if the state had decided to go to the 10-point scale, we would have been an F. Um, and that growth right there gave us nine points. So out of that 59, actually, we earned nine because of that. And, and really, the reason is, is it's not even really a true 80-20 formula right now. Um, the growth is, it really goes from 10 to 20. Everybody gets the first 10 for free in terms of growth. Um, and then the other 80% is, is based on proficiency there. So um, I'm a little biased, that's my school, but I, th I think to see where we stand in terms of um, growing students that, that in regards to all the other schools in the state, you know, we came within you know, a hair away from being labeled an, an F school. So I, I know that a lot of people are doing some work on that. So I, I want to certainly encourage you to, to do that, uh, c continue to improve that process um, as well. So thank you. I will piggyback on something she said with um, getting to know the students and relationship. I think as leaders on the school, we're the models. You have to be visible, you have to be there. But also, even if we're empowering teachers, giving the students a voice. The students have to be heard as well in allowing the teachers to build those times where they listen to the students. We have a principal advisory council. These children meet with me, but they also meet with their teachers because they need to be able to say what is working and what is not. If the teachers are able to do that, if we're able to do that, it's going to make a difference for the students in our schools. And uh, kind of piggybacking on that notion, I hear a lot of things that are spoken about, uh, such as building relationships and competencies that don't necessarily show up on the teacher evaluation tool. And I think what that teaches us is that a lot of these things are not as quantifiable. Uh, they're not an exact science. And that is to say, when we start talking about teacher leadership, I just came back from uh, uh, Washington, D.C. I had, had the pleasure of meeting with uh, all of the state teachers of the year. And in those conversations everywhere, teacher leadership kept coming up. But one thing that I recognized was that depending on where you went, it meant different things. A lot of institutions are now offering certificates in teacher leadership, where you take five classes and now you're a teacher leader. And teacher leadership doesn't work like that, <laughs> right? So you could be fresh out of a program, take some courses, and you're a teacher leader. As I mentioned before, these things are based on credibility. And the staff, ten it tends to be very organic. They tend to recognize that, and it may have nothing necessarily to do with instruction, but it does lift up the school. Just as an example, uh, some young teachers at Garinger uh, took upon the project. They decided they were excited about uh, growing plants, so they decided to create a community garden. And virtually overnight, that thing has become a source of pride for that school. It has totally shifted the mindset. Suddenly, grant dollars are pouring in. You can't tell me <laughs> that, that, that those teachers aren't leaders, right? They don't, have the, they don't have the title, right? It's not an ascribed thing. It's an accrued thing, uh, garnering the support and garnering the, um, the, the, the confidence of your coworkers. Um, you know, when we started Fresh, which was my mentorship program, we did that because we just kind of recognized that that first year in high school was, had a dramatic effect on their probability of graduating. And so nobody prompted us or told us to do anything. We responded, and we said, we need to put some sort of mentorship program together so that they, they have the better chance at n navigating some of the distractions of, of being in high school. Because I was that kid, you know? <laughs> I was that kid that was goofing around and doing all that stuff. So I wanted to lend that expertise, right, from so many failures, right? There's two ways to learn what to do and what not to do. I wanted to be able to offer that to those kids. And so I think one th we can't be so constrained in how we define teacher leadership, but we do need to have a ballpark, but not err to the side of prescribing it too uh, definitively. And I just want to piggyback on that. I feel like, um, you know, like you were saying, Mr. Ford, there are so many different definitions of teacher leadership that could look so different in, in any number of schools and districts. And I just wanted to give a plug to what Mr. Hassel was saying about the state supporting districts and schools in having that planning time uh, to actually think about what should that look like in Edgecombe County, because it probably looks different here than it would look in Martin County or in Johnston County or in any of the places that we are we are serving. And so, um, but having that time is a challenge and is a barrier. Even at the school level, thinking about, ah, oh, when am I going to get my 
my teachers together to talk about this, you know, to have these conversations about what our schedule should look like for next year. You know, everybody is so crunch for time, and and I, I do think we ask our teachers to be superheroes, like Eric was saying earlier. You know, we um, we expect so much of them, um, and they give that. You know, obviously, teachers like Mr. Ford are giving that to their students every single day. Um, but to have that opportunity to step back and think about, you know, what does this need to look like at Martin Millennium, I really feel like would move us forward uh, faster.